Welcome everyone. I'm Christine Thompson, Program Manager here at CGS, and I'll be your host for this insightful session today. If you can go ahead and please change your name and institution, uh, excuse me, your Zoom name to uh, your name, your institution, um, and if you choose to uh, use any pronouns. We have an exciting webinar ahead today as we dive into the strategies to support leadership, to support leadership and foster long-term sustainability in research initiatives, an essential aspect for any researcher looking to make a lasting impact. So before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. If you can advance to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, today's webinar will run from 1, at 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard. You have the option at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit any questions uh, using the Q&A feature. If you have any questions, please um, put that into the chat about how to use that. You are invited to use the chat to discuss the webinar with your fellow attendees as well, networking, et cetera. Uh, please keep the conversations on topic and please be respectful. And of course, uh, a recording of this webinar will be made available after the event for those of you who want to revisit the content um, and or share it with your colleagues. This will also be made available on the IGE Hub. More about that towards the end of this session. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Julia Kent, CGS's VP and co-PI for this IGE Hub. And Julia will walk us through the agenda, learning outcomes, and introduce our distinguished speakers. Thank you, Christine. Uh, greetings, everyone. We're really pleased that you can join us for today's Idea Lab. Uh, as you may already be aware, Idea Labs are part of a webinar series organized by the Innovations in Graduate Education IGE Hub. And since for some of you, this may be your first time joining an IGE Hub event, I'll just give a few words of background about the program and the hub. So the IGE program is an NSF funded program to support um, what NSF terms bold and potentially transformative innovations in graduate education. And my organization, the Council of Graduate Schools, has received an award from NSF to host the IGE Innovation Acceleration Hub. And really the, the goal of the hub is to make sure that IGE projects are more impactful and larger than the sum of their parts. And we do that by fostering learning and collaboration among the IGE awardees and um, provide broader dissemination of their graduate education research across the STEM graduate education community. So um, we, we do this work by sharing research on graduate education and hosting webinars like the IDEA Labs uh, designed to help faculty and administrators learn from each other uh, as well as other events. And one of those events was a PI meeting for IGE awardees last spring where the topic of today's webinar really um, was proposed and, and encouraged. So researchers with IGE grants um, wanted to know how they could start planning now to make their projects more sustainable once funding ran out. And we really believe that this is a topic that was of broad interest to those conducting research on graduate education, whether they were funded by NSF or through some other source. And, and that's why we're here today. So our agenda today is on the screen. Um, we'll have two presentations um, equaling uh, a total of about 30 minutes. We've reserved about 15 minutes for Q&A, and then we'll close with some, some announcements. So next slide, please. Um, to that end, I'm very pleased to introduce you to two IGEPIs who have done exceptional work to extend their research and interventions on graduate education beyond their period of funding. Um, our first speaker today is Dr. Mary Lynn Real Ralph, Associate uh, Chair for Undergraduate Programs in the School of Materials Science and Engineering at Georgia Tech. She'll be followed by Dr. Peter Harries, Dean of the Graduate School at North Carolina State University. And both of our presenters are PIs on projects they'll be telling you about shortly. So finally, I'll just call attention to the learning goals that we have for today's webinar. We hope that by the end of the hour, you'll have the ability to better identify potential university partners to support your program's sustainability efforts. 
Um, second, to apply some criteria for identifying industry partners that align with your project's long-term goals if your project involves ind industry partners. And then fo following that, um, a develop, develop a short-term plan for outreach to both internal and external partners. Um, and with that, I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to Dr. Mary Lynn Rupp. Thank you, Julia. I love uh, that you said you want to make things larger than the sum of their parts. Uh, that's one of the things we try to do <clears throat> with our Effective Team Dynamics Center uh, at Georgia Tech. Um, I'm Mary Lynn Ralph. I know you've already seen my bio, but just real quickly, I've been at Georgia Tech since 1992. Uh, I also did my undergrad here before that. And in between, I went to MIT and got a PhD there in mechanical engineering and polymer science and engineering. I also did a short stint at NSF as a program director for materials processing and manufacturing. But really, I'm passionate about helping people work better in teams uh, because I got very frustrated that our students, when they had trouble with teams, they would go to their professor, they would talk to them, and the professor would say something wonderful like, figure it out. You've been on a team before, figure it out. You're going to be on a team again, figure it out. And that really frustrated me because I knew there were ways we could help them figure it out. And I knew for certain, no one would say to an AE student, hey, have you ridden on a plane before? And yes, I've ridden on a plane. Uh, you're going to have to design one in the future, figure it out. That would be crazy. And then as we started looking at graduate students, we found out when we asked the faculty to write a list of who was on their team, we asked students to write a list of who's there on their team, their research team, the faculty didn't list the students and the students didn't list the faculty. So they didn't see themselves as on the same team. Uh, and also faculty were telling us, oh, my students can talk to me about anything. You know, that they, they're very open, they can come talk to me. And meanwhile, the students were talking to us, scared to talk to their professor about something. And so we really looked at what we learned with the undergrad students, and we've applied that to um, our IGE grant to help graduate students, as well as looking at the science of team science. Uh, but I know that you're um, more interested in sort of how do we do it so that it can be sustained. So just a little bit of history if we get the next slide. Um, so we developed the effective team dynamics um, program, and it first started with an undergrad and really we looked at the first year experience. And we also looked at Capstone and we had developed some things for those students because I'm director of undergrad affairs, that was sort of my area. Um, and then we developed a four year curriculum for those undergrad students, but all around those undergrad students were also graduate students. And can we click uh, a couple of clicks? Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, there were graduate students around, and there were also faculty around who said, hey, we need this for the graduate students. So we developed, uh, we wrote the IGE grant and developed the curriculum for graduate students. And as we did that, there were other faculty and staff who wanted the training. So we developed uh, training for faculty and staff and also for professionals because we interacted with industry and our external advisory board, and they also wanted something like that. We've even expanded it to look at the well-being of students, which is really important these days. Uh, we developed a well-being class, and right now we're in the phase of dissemination and assessment, and also, I should say, sustainability. So at the center of, next slide, please. At the center of our methodology is that we walk students through and faculty and graduate students through these three questions. Who am I? How do I team? And then how do we team together? I really won't spend a lot of time on this because I know that what you're really interested in today is uh, the sustainability. I know that you have access to the information and I'd love to talk to you about uh, our methodology later if you'd like to. But I'm going to move on to the sustainability. And really what we did is from day one, if we get the next slide, we developed the effort knowing that we wanted it to scale and knowing that we wanted it to be have sustainability. It started out as a project, then soon uh, you know it, it grew into a program, uh, then it was an initiative, now it's a center. We started with limited trainers and facilitators, and we knew that was going to be a limit for us. But the other limit, which I know you all have, is limited funds. And so I want to share with you how we uh, approach these two limitations that we had, thinking about how we're going to scale this. How is it going to be sustained past the grant period? So next slide. 
So one of the things we did is we thought about these facilitators and we knew that I couldn't do it. Facilitators on campus and the way we were able to have them all trained and also have them committed and helping us do all of the things that we do for undergrads and grad students and faculty staff. Really uh, what we did is we outlined for both the facilitator and the unit that they work for, what was gonna be expected from them. And as I said, it's student development. So we're asking them eight hours per semester to help us do these facilitated sessions. But we also wanted them to spend time in their unit to develop the people in their unit. We also wanted their input of how to make um, the effective team dynamics program better. And then I don't know if anybody's heard of the cobbler's kids and shoes, but the, the idea is that the cobbler's ch children have no shoes because the cobbler's making shoes for everybody else. We did not want that to be the case for our facilitators. So on number four here is professional development. It's four hours a semester. And basically we have a coaching circle. So each facilitator is coached by someone and is coaching someone else. And you're expected to meet uh, for one hour to talk about your coaching and one hour to talk about the person you're uh, coaching because we wanted to not just develop the students and the other faculty and staff, we wanted to also develop our facilitators. Um, and then we encouraged the people who were facilitators when they were out on campus in their uh, other things that they were already doing for campus, other co uh, committees or organizations they were part of, think about effective team dynamics and how we might partner. And so the results have been amazing. So if we can get the next click there. Um, yes, as I said, we showed the, the managers um, what they would do. We ask every manager that we ask, we ask them to pay for half the training uh, and all of them said yes. And this is about uh, two and a half thousand dollars for the training. A bigger ask was this eight hours a semester for at least two years. And I don't think we have, we have any facilitators that have done only two years. They love uh, being involved. They love that they are being developed and they really like developing uh, students. So this was one way we addressed, how do we get more facilitators? How do we partner with other units on campus? The other thing we did is we developed our materials. If we get the next slide, we developed my, our materials thinking about other institutions. So we the grant was to look at these materials, develop the workshops, and then offer them in different settings and different formats. So we have a full day workshop. We have a 50 minute segment. We have a half day workshop. We wanted it to fit in with what other institutions were doing. And we also wanted to train the other universities to offer the training themselves. So UT Health San Antonio has been at it the longest with us. They actually had part of their quality enhancement program, their QEP. The center of that program was the, the workshops that we developed for uh, through our NSF IGE. Uh, but we also have, um, have partnerships with these other universities where some of them we, we go to their university and other ones we've done a train the trainer program. We've also developed uh, one of the positive things about the pandemic was we actually wrote a supplement to develop an online self-service course. So that's a course where they can self-serve the lecturette part of it and then they have a discussion with their team on site. So another way that we're looking at partnering is to try to partner with other NSF type efforts. And so we've really made a partnership with the engineering research centers. And uh, if people don't know, these are centers where you have five or six universities. They are looking at big, huge problems. And definitely you want the sum of, of what they do to be more than the sum of just their parts. So we've developed the graduate student um, training. And we also have developed training for the leadership team. So we've been at Texas Tech developing their leadership team. Uh, later this month, we'll go and we'll be training um, the executive leadership team for the entire um, ERC. And um, we have different 
things that we talk about with them, but we look at how do you form that partnership? Why should you have those partnerships? Why are the partnerships working? How can you increase your communication so that those partnerships work even better together? And so we see this as one way to be able to disseminate to other places, but also sustain our work. And next slide. And one of the things that I'm super excited about uh, that we knew we wanted to get to, we didn't really know how to get there. Uh, it's a funny story. We were actually doing a uh, facilitation for finance at Georgia Tech. And I said, well, I'm trying to figure out how to, you know, make this a cost center so that we will be able to sustain our efforts. And that connection right there was key. Uh, your institute level finance office. Uh, sometimes it's not your, your local finance office. So I had been trying to work with my local finance office for, I don't know, eight to 10 months and it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, but once I made that connection to the institute level um, finance office to figure out what does a cost center look like at your university, that was really key. The other part of it th that we um, had to get everybody's buy-in and everybody's head around was instead of working as consultants, because that's that, that's sort of an easy way to do it, uh, we said, we're not going to work as a consultant individually. We want to be able to expand our research. We want to be able to expand um, our development of our materials. We want to see what impact they're making. So what we decided is to do a cost reco recovery model. Uh, if you don't know what this is, the 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 thing that kind of maybe maybe not sound right to you is that you can only recover your cost. You can't charge the going rate. So there are good and bad things with that. Uh, you can talk to your finance people to figure out that for your uh, particular university. Uh, but but we're hoping that this is going to really help us because we'll be able to go to other engineering research centers or other research uh, groups. And there will be an easy way that Georgia Tech can invoice them. And then uh, we have the financial people support to do all the business side of things. We've also partnered with Scheller College of Business uh, where we've developed materials for their executive MBA program. They are often contacted by industry who say, hey, Scheller College of Business, can you do some training for us? They don't really have anyone who does this effective team dynamics training. And so we're partnering with Scheller to help meet that demand from their uh, industry people that are contacting them. And we really um, think that this is gonna help us help form interdependent teams that can achieve even more than people individually together. I'd be happy to answer questions. Again, post them in the chat, but for right now, I'm gonna turn it over to Peter. Thank you so much, Mary Lynn. And that was a great introduction to what I want to talk about. And the IGE that we have is basically to support our program that's called Accelerate to Industry. I think it's pretty clear what we're trying to do based on the title. I mean, there's been lots written on non-academic careers for graduate students and the importance of preparing students for those. And, and really, that is the focus. And in terms of sustainability, what I really want to focus on are two elements. One is sort of the intellectual sustainability of the project that we've undertaken, and that'll become hopefully clear as we move along. And like Mary Lynn, we also want to delve into how do you make this financially viable so that you can continue delivering that content. So could I have the next slide, please, Sarah? So just to give you a, a brief introduction into what the concept of A to I is, it basically revolves around six different modules where we engage graduate students and also postdocs in terms of thinking about how they sort of adapt, if you will, in a simplistic way, their CV to a resume and become more insightful and more competitive for 
industry jobs. So the different modules that we have um, involve an industry search component where we use predominantly, but not exclusively alumni to talk about the pathway from their academic career, largely as PhD students into industry. Then we have a series called Job Search Strategies. We also do corporate visits. We do internships. We do a team practicum. And then probably our capstone is what we call our immersion week, where basically grad students in conjunction with people on the grad school staff, as well as our industry partners, spend a week really delving into different aspects of it. But let's move to the sustainability piece now. If you could go to the next slide, please. So if we think about how we have built this um, project and what we were basically funded to do was to build academic partnerships. Our goal when we started the IGE was to partner with 30 different institutions. At this point, we are up to 37. And really, that's where that sort of intellectual sustainability came in. Um, I don't know how many of you knew about Zoom prior to March 2020. I certainly didn't. Um, obviously, COVID did impact what we could do within the context of, of our project. But it also, by introducing us all to Zoom, allowed us to do things with our academic partners that you know, in all honesty, I'm not quite sure how we would have pulled off before that. And then we all, I also want to talk about industry partnerships, but let's start with the academic piece. If you could go to the next slide, please. So this right here, we still need to update it as we just have recently gotten some new partners. These are the institutions that we partner with, um, largely institutions in um, the U.S., but we also have a Canadian and a South African partner, and largely with graduate schools, but in some cases it's with individual departments, such as the chemistry department at UNC, and in some cases specific um, colleges, such as the College of Engineering at, at Arkansas. So really the goal here was to create a community of like why like like-minded folks who are also interested in basically creating pathways for their graduate students to move more effortlessly into the industry realm and you know one of the great things about having all these partners is we still meet um, monthly on zoom calls much of the money in the grant actually went to bringing our partners to campus to have basically a train the trainer process. And that really helped create not only cohesion between the people involved, but it also gave them the opportunity. It overlapped with our immersion week so they could see how we built the structure for our students. But the monthly meetings, are a critical exchange of information among the partners to really keep us thinking about and developing the A to I program that we're trying to undertake. So that's really where the intellectual sustainability comes in. And it's really the engagement of our partners that allows that to happen. Can you go to the next slide, please? So another thing, and this is really where the financial piece comes in, is that basically we partner and have partnered with a range of different companies. In some cases, through the network, we've been able to have companies that, for instance, are coming to our campus and are engaging with us, also engage with other schools where they have interest in their um in their graduate students, given the programmatic um, range that those students come from. As you may know, NC State is really a STEM-focused place. We have only a few PhDs, for instance, in the humanities and social sciences, but really 
Um, we have a STEM focus. So if you look at the companies that are there, a lot of them represent those types of companies. So, you know, there needs to be a lot done. I mean, and that's probably the hardest part, depending upon where you are in the country. I mean, we certainly benefit by having Research Triangle Park right in our backyard. But having these companies is really important, not only in terms of supplying intellectual capital, like we will have companies come in and do part of Immersion Week. People from companies will be part of the investigating industry careers sessions that we meet. And one thing that I should add is with our job search strategies, that is also available to all our partners um, using Zoom. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, how do we get funding from these folks? And really, um, there are two elements here, the industry insights that I mentioned, as well as the job search strategies that companies can engage with at no cost. Where we do get sponsorships are, for instance, for company site visits. In many cases, the companies will pay for the transportation, will host you know, our students for a lunch and so on. Um, internships, um, this is probably in all honesty, the area where we've struggled the most and, but we're starting to get some traction in that area too. And, and that obviously involves uh, sponsorships as well. Finally, for Immersion Week, depending upon how much time um, a sponsor wants to take, they will pay relative to that. Typically, BASF will, for instance, they'll want a whole day. I mean, at one point, they flew in 14 people from across the country to take part in this. And really, ultimately, what they want is the access to our students and the, the talent that exists on our campus. So it's great that they will come and bring their expertise. We tend to get, for instance, some of their hiring managers. Um, BASF runs a, a really well-oiled um, initial sort of employment opportunity for grad students where they'll basically move them around the country. We have had a number of students who successfully entered that and those students will often come back and be able to give advice and insights as to how they navigated it. And they also will have employees who will just help students, for instance, improve their resumes. And, and they're very engaged in the process. And I think, um, they really see a value in, in being able to engage in that way. One of the things that we've recently started is a career fair that is focused basically solely on graduate students. Um, last year, we had 18 folks, 18 different companies do that. Um, we charged them 300 bucks for a table. And they then had access not only to the people who were involved in our immersion week, we do it associated with that, but any graduate student could show up or a postdoc. And we had over 400 students register for that last year. So once again, it's not huge sums of money, but you know, you can do a lot and it really helps to have that sustainability piece if you have some money coming in and aren't solely, re, you know, reliant on whatever budgetary items you may have as, as a grad school or a university. Um, a typical, uh, I'm sorry, a critical additional element associated with that is also partnerships with various offices across campus. In working with our corporate sponsors. We've worked closely with the folks in Central Advancement who have looked at and deal with our industry partnerships. We don't want to cross wires with them. We've also built a really successful partnership with our Career Center, and they've really helped us in getting 
various people interested in our career fair, once again, given that specialized talent that is available at, at that, um, you know, through the graduate students and, and the various programs that they have on our campus. So I think that was my last slide. And I think I might have one minute left. So I think we can move to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Mary Lynn and Peter. Thank you so much. Um, so now we'll turn uh, to the question portion, the Q&A portion of this. Um, so please feel free to submit um, the questions in the Q&A function here. You can submit them just in general, or you can ask um, the questions particularly to Peter or Mary Lynn. Again, that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And in fact, while um, we're getting questions in the chat, um, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind pulling up the um, uh, contact information for uh, Mary Lynn and Peter, I believe that was on one of the last slides. Um, so we're going to look now at the Q&A. And we do have a question here. And I think this is for both. Um, how do you balance uh, how do you balance the immediate goals of research projects with a long-term sustainability planning, especially when it comes to leadership, leadership's focus on short-term outcomes? Um, and whoever would like to tackle that one first. I mean, I can start. Um, Absolutely. I, I mean, I think one of the issues that, you know, NSF has faced not only in the IGE space, but in other things like AGAP and so on, is that many of those programs basically cease to exist or become sort of a skeletal piece of what they once were when the funding goes away. So I've got to say that when we developed our project, sustainability was front and center, both in terms of the intellectual and academic piece that I mentioned, and then also the financial piece coming from, from the corporate partners. You know, one of the things that I am certainly fortunate to have is that I have quite a few staff who are focused solely on professional development. I know not all grad students, the school, sorry, have the resources that I do. So we really thought about how could other schools, like what is the model that we could develop that would help other schools that don't necessarily have all those resources still be able to do this. And you know, our partners are not forced to do all the modules. They can focus on what works for them. I mean, they can use the job search strategies that we offer. They can develop their, you know, their own stuff. So the model is very flexible and, and we hope is something um, valuable to our partners. And it sure seems to be that way based on the feedback that we've gotten and probably more critically, their continued engagement. I think for me, um, the goals, balancing the goals of the research versus long, long-term uh, goals or long-term sustainability. Um, we had a person on our grant who was, who kept having us go back to the grant, look at what we proposed, the research that we had proposed to do and ask the question, do, do, what have we learned? Do we want to stay on this path? Do we want to veer off that path to do more research in that area, uh, knowing that the whole time we promised to make something that would be useful to other people and other universities. So we intentionally kept asking ourselves that question, uh, meeting the research goals, but not just meeting the research goals, if that makes sense. We were open to look at new things. Um, the other thing is for Sustainability, you need these resources to have the resources you need an authentic demand. So as Peter mentioned, the companies want access to our students. That is an authentic demand. They will come if they can have uh, access to those students. And what we did in our grant is to look to see what situations are people in, the people that we care about, what is the situation that they're in where they're stuck? Certainly a graduate student is stuck if they can't talk to their faculty about something that's important. Certainly the faculty is stuck, even if they don't know they're stuck, if they think their student can come talk to them about anything and it's not the situation. And certainly if there's discourse and uh, negative discourse in the lab, uh, things will not be getting done. Or if people are asking things from different universities for a larger grant and people are just, you know, ticked off at each other and not talking, like they're stuck. 
they are stuck. So we really spent a lot of the research time, not only developing the workshops, but developing the scenarios that are part of the workshop and base them on talking. We talked to over 125 students about the situations they were in. And we talked to faculty about the situations where they felt stuck. So I think you need to be developing something where there's an authentic demand for it. Um, but you do have to be in, intentional to ask yourself those questions as you go along. Wh what are we showing with our research? Where do we want it to go? And how how do we spend our time now so that sustainability, it, we won't be thinking about, oh, we've got six months left on the grant. That's too late. That's too late to think about it. You need to really be intentional. Uh, but it is it is kind of kind of a hard balance. You have to, well, I guess we don't have to give NSF exactly what we promised them, but it would be really nice if we could give them at least what we promised them as far as the research uh, results and the and the innovation in graduate education that we propose. Great, great. Um, I have another question in the chat or in the uh, Q&A, and this one's for Mary Lynn. Um, it was regarding one of your slides. Um, how do you measure the effectiveness of your partnership, the effectiveness of the training with your partners? You mentioned that um, in one of your slides. Um, so, um, of course, we do a net promoter score. Would you subject your friends to this uh, training? Uh, but then we also look at, um, so with our well-being course, we actually do some measurement uh, measurement of well-being and see if the students are uh, getting some of those skills for well-being that we're trying to uh, to have them um, gain. We also talk to the students about, are they able to handle their own stuff? So I remember the day that there was a student group in my office. I, would I teach senior design and this group said, this week, Dr. Ralph, we had, you know, we had to talk about our team dynamics and we talked about it and we figured out how to deal with it. And I thought I was gonna scream and jump out of my seat because they said team dynamics back at me. And so um, we're seeing things like that, but we're also measuring um, uh, how the students rate each other um, in the in the groups as well as other aspects. I'd be glad to share that part of it with anybody who wants to. It's kind of, yes, we're trying to measure it. Uh, do I feel like we've measured it the best as possible? No, uh, it's a hard thing uh, because you you talk to someone about their team blowing up or, you know, <laughs> How how much level of voting you off the island is is a dysfunctional team? So that it is a hard thing. It is a hard thing to measure. We're we're doing our best to have some measurements of it. Thank you, thank you, um, Peter. This question is for you um, regarding the. This is specifically to the monthly meetings that you have with your uh, with your partners, um, academic and industry. Uh, excuse me, academic, how do you maintain engagement with those academic partners, um, especially leading up to the monthly meetings? And have you seen a drop off? And how do you re-engage them? Yeah, I think, I mean, as with any Zoom call, you have more and less engaged folks. I, I think one of the things that we have really pushed is, you know, in order to have engagement, is to have people report out what they've been up to. And I think, you know, we all learn from that. Like we're a STEM focused campus, but for instance, Duke is running one that is focused on their humanities and social science students. So, and Concordia is doing the same thing. So learning from what other people are doing, it, I think is, is, is really powerful. I, you know, and I'll admit, I do worry a bit, you know, that's one piece of funding we won't have is to to bring the folks to our campus on an annual basis. So we would bring, you know, not just the new people, but also the people who have been engaged in the project. Well, I guess since we got a no cost extension for four years. And, you know, I do wonder if we lose, you know, that that yearly personal connection that we may see some falling off. Um, you know, and I can't say that every partner shows up for every meeting, um, you know, but we tend to get around 20 people total, maybe a few more. Um, but, you know, it is going to be a challenge, I think. And and I think ultimately it, it relates to how people perceive the value of those meetings. So I think we're going to have to continue to think about, you know, how do we ensure that we're doing new things and conveying new ideas? 
I love that. Uh, getting them to report out on on their progress. Yeah, that is really key. Okay. And that sort of holds them a little bit accountable too. Exactly. So, that, you know, like, what are you, like, we want to know what they're doing with the project. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, we do, we do survey them on a pretty regular basis just through our external evaluator, but obviously we're going to lose that piece too, right? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty major budget chunk. I don't think we're going to get, end up getting enough corporate support to keep that going. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question that I've been combining because it is a common question here. Um, you know, here in this call, we have some people who have just recently um, received the um, uh, NSF DGE award, IGE award. So we have some um, new awardees here. And for those of them that are getting started with their projects, um, what are some things that they can plan now for sustainability? And I mean, just getting started 2024 awardees, um, some long-term um, ideas for sustaining their projects. And this question is for both whoever wants to answer first. Well, I think um, what we tried to point out today, and you noticed it probably in the learning objectives, is really think of those partnerships. Um, we didn't get to 16 facilitator. It wasn't in our grant to have 16 facilitators, right? We, we didn't have enough money to train 16 facilitators in what we were trying to do. So I think uh, thinking about who your partners are, who cares about what you're doing, um, it, even thinking about the day one, and also just letting people know what you're up to. Everybody's super busy on campus. And so when you have um, a chance, you're in a meeting, you're uh, out and about on campus, talk to people about what you're doing. The number of people that I've just kind of come across, the, the really great connection we have for, to Scheller College of Business, which is where the industry come to, you know, to get some training. Uh, that was because I came across someone when I was coming across campus and I just happened to mention what I was up to. So I would say, um, talk to people about what you're doing. Have your little, like, it's not even an elevator speech. They'll, they'll ask you, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. You know, I'm really busy with my new IGE grant. I'm really excited about it because we're trying to blah, 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 whatever you're trying to do. Then later, when they're thinking about expanding what they want to do, they might think of you. And they, when you mention that, they may say, oh, we're doing such and such, or we have this program, or we have this sponsor who likes to come in and talk to our students, or something where there's a connection a connection there. And then a, a plug for this group who put the webinar together, you know, come to the site, look at the information there, see what other people have done and steal our ideas, please. Take our ideas, uh, contact the network, I would say, um, because, you know, we're, a lot of us are professors. We love to talk and give advice. And I'll let Peter answer now. <laughs> yeah, I think Mary Lynn covered much of what I would have said. The, the one thing that I'll add is that you know, if your graduate school is not really aware of your IGE, I mean, I know there's been some on this campus that I had no idea about until, you know, long after they were funded. I would say view the grad school as a partner to help you in in disseminating what you're trying to do, thinking about what you're trying to do, potentially linking you up with partners. Cause I agree with Mary Lynn, like finding those partners, whether they're on campus or industry partners or, you know, other institutions is, is really a critical part of sustainability. And I think something that you need to think about earlier rather than later. I mean, if you try to build it at the end, it's probably not gonna be very successful. So I would just say, you know, start making those connections. The other thing I would add to that is um, people are writing grants. Um, if you include postdocs, you need to do a postdoc development plan. You need to grow a graduate student development plan. Uh, a lot of the IGEs, develop graduate students, right? Their, your innovations in graduate education. Uh, so also thinking about what would your little paragraph that you would add to someone else's proposal look like? And what does the little mini budget look like? Um, and so we have that, uh, it's gone in lots of grants that have been told, said no, a couple that have said yes. Uh, but if you kind of think how, how do you fit into someone else's world of how they're trying to prepare graduate students as well? Thank you very much. Um, and that actually 
touches on probably the last uh, question we have time for, um, and it might be a bit thorough. So speaking of the elevator pitch and plugging your project in as you're uh, networking around campus, um, as regarding the college deans and provost offices, how can you make the case for funding with them? Um, and, and specifically, how do you non, how do you make the case for communicating your project to non-research stakeholders? So a bit of both, um, both questions there, and that'll probably be our last one before we wrap up. I mean, I think I can start with that. I, you know, actually when we, early on, when we were developing this and we talked to our advancement office, they were pretty excited about it from two perspectives. One is in terms of alumni engagement in like not your typical undergraduate scholarship piece, but allowing a broader perspective on what advancement can be. And, you know, I'm certainly fortunate in that regard and that our advancement office, as well as a lot of the deans have funding for grad schools as one of their first, well, one of their top priorities for their fundraising. Um, in terms of making the case to the provost, I think there you really need to show impact. I mean, I, I don't know how else to do it. Um, you know, I haven't asked because my provost funds my staff pretty hard for me to say, oh, I want more money to do this. So I'm really relying on those on those corporate sponsorships to to help sort of push our program forward. Um, there's, I'll yes, let we, Mary Lynn go, and then maybe I'll maybe I'll type in that answer to that. Yeah, there's a question in the chat there, um, which I'm happy to. Uh, Mary Lynn, did you have a comment on this last question that I just asked about? Um, well, I I was kind of at an advantage because. Uh, I we co-wrote the grant with a person out of the provost office, so we didn't have to convince the provost office that it, it was something good uh, to do. Uh, that said, uh, we have not gotten any money directly from the Georgia Tech deans or provost office to uh, to pay for graduate students or uh, tuition. However, we did get some money from the dean's office to help us disseminate and do a social media campaign um, around effective team dynamics. And um, it was, we sort of tagged along to, to a bigger effort um, that the College of Engineering was doing to try to, to see, can we, can we do these social media campaigns and will it, will it affect something? And so there were all these messages that we sent out uh, having to do with recruiting and retaining students and getting students to apply. And it turned out Effective Team Dynamics was the message that got the most hits. So I was ecstatic about that, that, that people from outside were really interested in sort of team dynamics. So I think you've got to think sort of outside the box of uh, RAs and tuition and things like that um, to say what would help you sustain, what would help you disseminate, uh, what would help get the word out, what would help find those partners outside the Institute that it's an easier yes from the Dean's office or from the provost office. Um, I mean, they, they spent 25 K to help us do a, a social media campaign. Um, and, and we got some people to contact us based, based on that. A lot of good insights here. I'm writing down as well. And, uh, it looks like the question that Carrie Aspler, um, do industry partners actually contribute funds or money to cover uh, to the to your program to cover costs for research assistance or tuition? And uh, Peter, you um, had in the chat you aren't you aren't getting any student funding. Yeah, I mean there was there was a company that wanted to do it, but as I wrote in the chat, COVID kind of destroyed that. And I think you know, had we been able to get someone to start that, I think other people probably would have glommed onto it too. I want to thank you both so much um, for your insights, um, viewing the grad school as a partner and showing the impact uh, to help make the case for provost um, offices and college deans, I think was my biggest takeaway. So hopefully um, everybody had took away something here that they can implement on their campus. Um, so as we wrap up today's webinar, um, again, I want to extend a huge thanks to our speakers, um, Peter Harries and Mary Lynn Ralph, for sharing your insights on securing leadership buy-in and strategies for research sustainability. 
Um, I hope you all found the session as engaging and informative as uh, we all have. And before we close, I have a couple of reminders here. So our CGS annual meeting um, is every December, and I want to um, invite everyone to go onto our CGS website to look at what we have for uh, this upcoming year. Um, in particular, one of our IGE awardees, Julie Selt, uh, with University of Southern California's Graduate School, um, will be hosting a plenary session on systemic change in higher ed. Um, our next uh, piece is joining our LinkedIn group. In a moment, we'll advance the slides and you'll be able to see the um, QR codes that you can um, use your camera for, your phone camera. Um, but right now, the LinkedIn group has 90 members. This group was created as a space for STEM innovators to share initiatives, resources, and networks. So if you are um, on LinkedIn, we'll show um, the slide in a second, um, so that way you can get access um, to be uh, a member. And lastly, to receive monthly information about our project outcomes, disciplinary society calls for proposals, events and resources, you can subscribe to our bi-monthly um, IGE Insider newsletter. On the next slide, you'll see a little bit about what our LinkedIn group looks like. Um, you can use your phone camera to scan here. And in the chat, um, you can see um, our very own Kelly Carnes. She just entered the links to the LinkedIn group if you don't have your phone handy. And on the next slide, you'll see our IGE newsletter. So again, this newsletter, we put everything in here. We want to make sure that you're updated with um, all sorts of events throughout um, graduate education. Um, we have some new themes emerging as well um, as we look through some of our new projects uh, for 2024. Again, you can scan the QR code there or you can enter it into the uh, you can look at our chat and click on the link. And thank you very much for also including the annual meeting. Um, I want to uh, round out with just some contact information for the IGE Hub. Again, you um, heard from Julia Kent, our VP and co-PI for the IGE Hub, as well as myself, I'm the program manager here at CGS. If you have any uh, questions, concerns, updates, things you'd like to share about your projects, um, any new information or initiatives, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, or Julia, we are just an email away. Um, and then I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Mary Lynn and Peter to enter their contact information. Um, I know we had a slide um, where we can bring up that slide too, um, Sarah, it's on one of the last slides, um, but Peter has his email in there to connect with him about anything A2I or STEM graduate education related. And then Mary Lynn just entered her email address in there too to talk about the ETD at GA Tech. So again, I want to thank you all. We're finishing, we're wrapping up a little bit early and um, I hope everyone has a great rest of the day and we appreciate everything you do for STEM graduate education. Thank you.